in for a, a real treat tonight. We're very fortunate to have uh, the distinguished international lawyer Robert Amsterdam with us to talk about his experiences uh, in Russia and elsewhere uh, during his long career in legal practice. Mr. Amsterdam is a member of the Canadian and International Bar Associations, earned his BA from Carleton University in Ottawa, and studied law at the Queen's University in Ontario. Uh, for the past 27 years, he's been practicing law, most recently as founding partner of the Toronto-based firm, Amsterdam and Perra. He's overseen numerous high-profile cases involving shareholder disputes, corporate restructuring, fraud and asset uh, recovery, corporate human rights advocacy, and human rights advocacy, and complex commercial litigation. Uh, he's also an advisor on political risk and corporate foreign policy. He has a great deal of international experience, not only in Russia, but also in Hungary, Nigeria, Venezuela, and Guatemala, representing uh, very senior international clients. Um, including most prominently uh, since 2003, the former CEO of the Yukos oil company, Mikhail Khodorovsky. Uh, please join me in welcoming uh, from, to the University of Chicago, Robert Amsterdam. I'm very grateful to be here, and I'm going to start by talking about the news that's occurred in the last 24 hours. And, and crazily enough, uh, having grown up as a, a baseball fanatic, for some reason, when I heard that news, I thought of a Boston Red Sox player named Carl Yastrzemski. And I don't know why Vladimir Putin and Carl Yastrzemski were tied together in my mind, but I watched Yastrzemski when I was a boy, and I remembered his final game. And in fact, today, is the 24th anniversary of his final game. And I always thought that there was a life's lesson in that kind of athlete who does a tremendous job in his chosen profession and knows when to leave the field. In Russia today, Mr. Putin, and let me make clear, I, I, I firmly believe he has no desire to stay on. It is not that he is desperate for political power. It is that he has no way out. If you engage in the destruction of the rule of law in as systematic and sweeping a way as Mr. Putin has done, there is no possibility that your future can be guaranteed. There is, in fact, in his mind, no guarantee that the very arrangement he came to with his predecessor can be met with the next leader of the Russian Federation. And it is also clear that the incredible level of Byzantine fighting within the clans in the highest levels of the Kremlin has reached a point where he must cling to the ring of power because that is the only way that this fighting can in any sense be controlled. We in the West and particularly in the United States have no understanding of the dramatic instability at the top of Russia today. In fact, there is a narrative spun by a, an individual who will forever go down in history as the pillar of both opportunism and treachery to his own people, the former German Chancellor Schroeder, there is a, a sense uh, in, in dealing with that that we have going on today that, that Germany had decided with Mr. Schroeder that there was going to be an acceptance of a very Faustian bargain. The Germans were going to get stability in Russia, and the Russians were going to live with autocracy. And Mr. Schroeder was prepared to name that autocrat a Democrat, and he was prepared to campaign for Mr. Putin as a Democrat to all the leaders of the West, even to that leader who saw in Mr. Putin a spy who had engaged 
in uh, various nefarious activities during his period in Dresden, even to some leader in the West who saw in Mr. Putin a soul. So we have this unique situation now where Mr. Putin is bound up by his own compromises and by his own deals and arrangements. And this has been brought about in a way that has just been identified by a number of British professors as a securitizing narrative. And a securitizing narrative is a narrative which consistently is based on the development of a dialectic, an either-or scenario, for which Russian history is very rich. I call it the victim narrative, the idea that Russia has been the victim of the West, the victim of the West in the 90s, the victim of the West in the 40s with some great deal of reality and 20 million civilian deaths. And this victim narrative then gets manipulated and extended so that it moves from reality to an instrument of control. And we go from the great patriotic war to a view of new immigrants in Russia, which so desperately needs immigration as a tremendous security threat, which further glorifies the power ministries. We see in the security doctrine, a media security doctrine, one of the first things adopted under Vladimir Putin's rule, securitizing the media and identifying the media as an area of danger for the development of democracy in Russia. We see in that narrative a development in respect to the buildup that we're seeing in Russia right now with the armed forces, and clearly we see in that narrative the development of energy and resource nationalism as a method of control. Today, one day after the parliamentary elections in Ukraine, we have another attempt by Gazprom to cut off supplies to Ukraine. There is no question that the fact that Mr. Putin, the fact that President Putin could announce that he was going to go to become, to move to become prime minister at the very moment, the very, the very moment when this loss in Ukraine takes place and then move so quickly to repeat the lessons of two years ago with the Orange Revolution, demonstrate the overwhelming impunity he continues to feel he enjoys. And he enjoys that impunity because this administration in particular believes, number one, they are hostage to Russia in respect to Iran, which is, in terms of any sort of historical analysis, an amazing thing to believe. And number two, and I think this is very important on the near the anniversary of Anna Politkovskaya's death, because the same securitizing phenomena that turned a horrendous tragedy in a school in Beslan into the end of federalism in Russia has brought in this country a tremendous use of the same fear and securitization to transmogrify the office of the president to expand the search and seizure powers and to dramatically change the very environment of civil liberties and human rights in the United States today. It is very important that we understand this securitizing formula because it explains the close relationship the United States and Russia have in certain strategic areas still and the unwillingness of the Bush administration to complain loudly or say anything at all concerning Chechnya. We have, over the last number of years, stood in silence to Guantanamo and silence to Chechnya. And we have, there is a commonality there 
And it is incredibly important that in terms of the issues of human rights that are so central to us all, that we not allow the human rights agenda to be taken over by those who want to use some argument of cultural relativity to exclude some of our most basic and fundamental rights, freedoms, and tenets. Right now, I act for a political prisoner being held illegally under Russian law in Siberia, 6,000 miles from his home. He is in this camp in Siberia because the West was prepared to be silent at his show trial and because the West was silent when his corporation was illegally taken, when these bogus taxes were assessed, and then some of the leading Western companies were prepared to participate in this orgy of destruction and actually attempt to launder the reputation of the Kremlin using the phony auctions as a way to gain what I call Putin points. Putin points is a very important thing to understand. It's how Russia is ruled today. All of us know the point system. It substitutes for meals and airplanes. You take a certain carrier, you get a certain number of points, and then you get some sort of free trip so that you can be delayed once again. And in dealing with the Kremlin, there is this incredible movement towards non-transparency outside of the rule of law, such that you're in a situation in the Kremlin where the way you talk the language of the Kremlin is you call them Democrats, you agree to working with either Gazprom or Rosneft, whichever is the one particular energy company you need at the time, and you agree to negotiate bilaterally with the Kremlin. This is one of the most important strategic options the Kremlin faces, which is they are big disaggregators. They don't want to deal with the EU. They want to deal with everyone separately. They don't want to deal with NATO. They're prepared to deal with the United States. And it is one of their key themes. And it's, it's what's led in Europe to tremendous divisiveness and to what we call Q-jumping. Italy has now taken over Germany's place under Schroeder and has jumped to the head of the line. And because they participated in an illegal UCOS auction, they managed to get a part of the new 25% or so li liberalized electrical uh, reform that took place in Russia, and they were able to buy some distribution assets. The point of all of this is that transparency and the rule of law are fundamental to growth. They are fundamental not only to human rights, but to economic development. And the reason why they have become so dangerous to pursue in Russia, why my client is in jail because of transparency, and why journalists are dead because of their interests in transparency, and while other newspapers and radio stations are tremendously impacted is because there is a tremendous danger in the truth getting out. The fact of the matter is oil exploration in Russia has been going down precipitously each year. This year, Gazprom will actually produce less gas than last year. Russia today is more dependent on energy exports than it was in 1991. And this malaise on energy is a political issue. It is a political determinant that was brought about by Mr. Putin because there is, in fact, no Putin industrial policy to speak of. There has been a policy, and it has been a concerted policy, to enhance the power ministries and strongly take control over energy in Russia. And what that has led to is the Kremlin controlling over 
of oil in Russia in terms of uh, the market and in terms of gas with Gazprom's ownership and outside of a few uh, competitors, the control is almost total. And that has been used, as I said earlier, as a, a political weapon and it continues to be used day by day. And whether it's Georgia, whether it's Estonia, whether it's Germany, whether it's the United Kingdom, or whether it's the United States, there is this lack of transparency leading to a tremendous growth in what I have called corporate foreign policy, which is the ability of corporate actors to engage in foreign policy without any form of review. In Germany, it goes on with Eon Ruhrgas. In Italy, it's any. But in the United Kingdom, it's British Petroleum. These companies that are decisive in terms of the Russia relationship, who have managed to make a tremendous impact on the relationship between their own executive and the Russian executive, because the Russian executive has convinced people not only of the victim narrative in terms of Russian history, but the scarcity narrative, and the fact that you cannot but concede to Russian power in the energy sphere if you want to make any number of related deals, whether it's in respect to Kosovo, whether it's in respect to some of the economic relationships that are hanging fire, whether it's in relation to the energy charter, which the United States as well has not signed, but which Russia did sign, but argues it will not ratify. These, this ongoing willingness to defy international law in terms of treaties is best exemplified by the European Convention of Human Rights. There are today in Strasbourg literally 40,000 applications, either from Russia or other countries within the CIS. Strasbourg, which is the human rights home of Europe, is so completely inundated that it has barely the ability to respond. It is drowning in the sea of complaints because, unfortunately, in terms of Russia today, the independence of the judiciary has been completely compromised. And with the, the exhaustion of that judicial independence, there is no control on the virus that is Chechnya. Let me tell you from having worked in Russia in this trial before I was arrested, Chechnya is not a description of a location on a map. Chechnya in Russia is a psychology. You cannot have your boys go and experience what the Russian army experiences in Chechnya and have them then turn into the police and prosecutors in your hometown and not understand that it will change forever your internal dynamics. Russia is suffering from Chechnya as much as Grozny is suffering. And you see it. You see it with the fear. You experience it. Uh, it's very hard for me to talk about the fact that today is the anniversary, or not today, in a few days, will be the anniversary of the murder of Polikovskaya. Not only is she to me a living, breathing, laughing human being, but she was a tremendous Western, if you will, conscience. And I don't mean that as being in any way non-Russian, because she was completely Russian. But she was completely willing to laugh at some of the aspects of Russian society that today it is almost impossible to laugh at. She was able to, to assess the situation within her own country and understand that it wasn't just that the, the Siloviki were in the process of dismembering federalism and the judiciary and all of these other critical sectors of society. What was the greater crime 
was that when she unearthed either the terrors of Chechnya or the grotesque corruption of the Kremlin, no one seemed to care. There was a movie in which she was captured talking with shock about the fact that one of the people in the Nord-Ost attack, one, one of the actual terrorists in Nord-Ost was found to be working in the presidential administration six months later. And no one, when that article came out in Novaya Gazeta, even complained. And what shocked her so much was the development of this apathy. And that apathy comes as a result of what she called the doppelganger theory. And the doppelganger theory is very important, and it's completely true. A friend of mine is now on trial in Russia. His name is Andrei Piankovsky. He is a great Russian writer and critic of the Kremlin. He is on trial for extremism. Now, Piankovsky is extreme only in the fact that he believes Vladimir Putin is bad news and doesn't mind telling you about it. The people who are putting him on trial are the people who are funding the Nashi, which is a 100,000 strong group of thugs who walk around various cities attacking political opponents of the Kremlin. But the extremist is Piontkovsky. My client, Khodorkovsky, was the largest taxpayer in Russian history. So you charge him with tax evasion. This is how the doppelganger works. And by the time when you're a citizen in a country like this, that you go through and you hear all of these stories and you taint these people like Khodorkovsky. By the time you're finished, you don't know what's up or down. You're atomized. You're unable to form a group. In fact, in our criminal case in Russia, it was the forming of this group. My client had an oil company. The Russian Federation decided that what they were going to do was turn Russia's most profitable company into something called an organized group so that they could put Mr. Khodorkovsky away for a decade. So that's what they did. They took Russia's most transparent company and they used the fact that Khodorkovsky put his holdings and his share structure on the web. They used this to demonstrate he had an organized group. And when we challenged them, they said, it's right here on the web. And so we said, but how many criminals publish their structure? How do you prove a criminal mafia-like organization about people who are disclosing all of this information? How is it done? And of course, all you see is you know, what I call the Putin shrug, because everybody knows. Everybody in that court knew. The prosecutors weren't prosecutors. The judges weren't judges. We barely felt like lawyers. It was a show trial. It was a show trial, and the fear that has developed since then, since that time, 70 years after the days of Yezov and the earlier show trials, demonstrate, unfortunately, where Russia is continuing to go. No matter what, our companies who are there are telling us the situation in Russia when it comes to rule of law is only deteriorating. Item one, last week, in a publication by the World Bank, Russia sank to number 145 in the Global Corruption Index. Now, to be at number 145, you have to be somewhere around Zambia and Zimbabwe. Here is a member of the G8 that is ranking number 145 in corruption. 
and is almost at the top of the list, number three in terms of the safety and security of journalists. What do those two numbers tell us? They tell us that Russia in the post or pre-Putin period, however we're now going to call this new period, is going to be continuing in an unstable legal and political environment. The leading investigator, the leading anti-fraud investigator in the Russian Federation was murdered Saturday night. The leading bank reformer was murdered a year ago. And beware of the anti-corruption ministry because if we follow Anna's advice, we all know they are the most corrupt. And why is the new prime minister, formerly head of money laundering? Because he knows where everyone's accounts are. These, this is the, the 1984-like thinking that we need to start to understand. And when it comes to foreign policy, it is worse. Because when it comes to foreign policy, you have to consider the United States. And in this administration, the foreign policy review that will one day take place will have to find a new letter beside F. Because merely giving this administration a failing grade doesn't begin to cover it. How the United States could be now so weak in Latin America that Vladimir Putin could be a major, major pillar of support for Hugo Chavez. And Mr. Chavez could be talking to both Argentina and Brazil about importing Russian pipeline technology and using Russian pipeline technology to restructure the gas infrastructure of Latin America. And this could be done with a straight face, is beyond imagination. Four billion dollars in Russian arms to Venezuela. And that's before we talk about Iran. That's before we talk about Ahmadinejad. And the fact of the matter is, the technology being used by Iran today in the nuclear fight is Russian technology. And when we talk about Syria and what's going on in Syria today, the latest Russian anti-missile technology available has been sold and is now being put in place in Syria. We all have to be cautious of Russia because when a country is engaged in the sale of both munitions and energy as their key export sectors, global instability represents boom time. And it's a, it is a, an, a very important moment we are in, because at the very moment that this instability exists in Russia, which many of our pundits are calling stability and are welcoming Mr. Putin's continuance in office, we will have the issue of Kosovo independence. And the Kosovo independence issue will be coming up right around the time of the Duma elections. So these are going to be it is going to be a very serious time for all of us in respect to the very future of Central Europe and the very future of U.S.-Russia relations as both countries enter what will be a, a critical election year. Now, I, I've already overstayed my time. I just want to take 60 seconds and say to you that there will be another Khodorkovsky trial. I don't feel it fair if I get a chance to speak to anyone and not mention the fact that not only has this man been stabbed, not only has been, he been placed over a uranium mine, not only has he been sent 6,000 miles from his family, but at the very hint of parole, the Russian authorities are now seeking to lay new charges. And these new charges are called money laundering. Again, you have to understand Anna's theory because what the people who have laundered the money are the people in the Kremlin. But they will nail him 
on largely the same facts they tried to get him for last time, but now they'll, they'll say that he moved the money so that they can get him for money laundering, put him away for another 10 to 15 years in an even more remote location. And Mikhail Kordakovsky is not alone. There is a new generation of political prisoner in Russia today. Their names are Sutyagin, Danilov, Trepashkin, Bakhmina. I can go on and on. Svetlana Bakhmina, 32-year-old lawyer at Yukos, arrested at 5 a.m. in front of her two children in Moscow, taken to a def detention facility, interrogated till she collapsed, taken to hospital, brought back, interrogated some more. She has not been seen for three years. She is in a labor facility in the Ural Mountains. She has never seen her children. And for the first six months of her incarceration, she was not allowed to speak to her children because the prosecutor general said that the only time she will see freedom is when her boss is brought back to Russia from London. So the prosecutor general was basically prepared to admit that he was taking hostages. The situation in Russia and how the Russian Kremlin is treating its people is an absolutely critical thing to understand Russian foreign policy. A great Russian who was a nuclear physicist said to the West from Gorky many, many years ago that the West needs to understand that the way the Soviet Union was treating its citizens was dispositive in terms of how it would deal with the West in the event of confrontation. We have in this country no focus on Russia. We have very little understanding. And this is going to lead to an unhappy ending if we don't wake up to what is going on. And if we don't understand that four more years of Vladimir Putin is not good news for the world, and it's not good news for Russia. Thank you very much. I'm going to abuse the chair of the, the position of moderator, uh, moderator, though, and ask the first one. Um, your final story about the lawyer imprisoned in the Ural Mountains reminds us that lawyers often uh, have to undertake acts of great courage in defending clients who may be unpopular. Um, and I know that you and your experience have personally been paid a price at times for, uh, for your work in this case. I wonder if I could just ask you to say a word about that, your experience in prison in Russia. The Hordokovsky trial was a trial like no other because at the beginning of the trial and for the first third of the trial, we had a tremendous amount of press coverage in Russia and outside Russia. And when he was first arrested, all of the lawyers, and there were three or four of us, received a notice that the Russian authorities would arrest us on entry into the country. Because I, as a boy, I had spent much time in Russia, I wasn't very concerned because it, didn't, it just didn't make sense to me. So I went to the trial, well, to the first bail hearing and ended up uh, not only, uh, it was an absurd situation, they, they carried Khodorkovsky in like he was uh, a terrorist. There were 30 Spetsnaz special forces, and there were these three big guys in front of the door because it was a closed court. The public wasn't allowed in. So using my lousy Russian, I told them I was his lawyer, and these guys were huge, but I managed to push push the two of them apart, get into the court, talk to Hordakovsky for quite a while. And then we were shocked by the fact that both the prosecutor and the judge were on the phone. This, at this moment, this case was unbelievably important in Russia, and in many ways it still is. And there was this complete political control over the process, telephone justice. So. Uh, I was deeply offended 
because of the clear lack of due process that was taking place. And the press was outside. And Russia's not the United States. Lawyers don't often speak to the press, certainly not given the stakes. But I was very irate. And in Russian, the word for pocket is karmani. And while we were preparing for this case, Basmani court, which is the court where these hearings were held, was known to the defense lawyers in Moscow. They had a song, which I won't scare you by singing, which was about how the Basmani court was in the pocket of the procuracy. There was, if you went to the Basmani court, you could only lose. So I went outside of the court and I gave a statement. And I said that Russia had fallen prey to Basmani justice, the political justice. And what happened was, amazingly, I coined a new word for Russia. And that term is still used to this day to describe, essentially, political justice inside Russia. So I made no friends because, in fact, during the whole process, because I had spent my life involved with Russia, I would always speak about this case in historical terms. And I would compare it to prior show trials. And I would compare the judge in this case to Vyshinsky and you know, the goings on in this case to what happened in Moscow in the 30s. So by the end of the trial, the international press did not abate. There would be two to 300 journalists outside the courtroom. And the Russian authorities, in this securitizing mentality that I spoke about, turned the courtroom into an armed camp. By the final days of the trial, we had 500 troops. We had hundreds of guard dogs. We had helicopters. We had parts of the city closed. It was insanity. And we also had our own FSB, which is the sort of secret police types, who would follow us and harass us and do whatever. So we managed to get through all of this. And then Khodorkovsky has a ridiculous one-day appeal. And I won't even go, I won't even begin to describe the farce that this appeal was. Not even the transcript from the trial was ready for the appeal. But they had so hurried the appeal because Khodorkovsky had decided he was going to run for a Duma by-election. And by running in this by-election, he had shown that he was actually very popular. Because believe it or not, this billionaire was winning. So if he would have stayed on the ticket, he was going to win this seat. Well, the power could not have this. And what I had done was, I, of course, had been in Russia before the appeal. I was always invited by Echo Muscovy, which is an amazing radio station that is allowed to speak, even to this day, uh, something that comes close to the truth of what's going on. I was interviewed for an hour. And it was a very wide-ranging interview, and they asked a lot of questions about my legal career and the fact that I work in Nigeria and Guatemala. And they said, well, Advocate Amsterdam, if you had a choice between Guatemala, Nigeria, or Moscow to do a political case, what's your answer? And I said, being the diplomat that I am, I would sooner be buck naked in the streets of Lagos than fight a political trial in Moscow. Well, I just violated all of the Russian rules. One of them being that comparing Moscow unfavorably with any country, particularly a developing country, is just not acceptable. So having decried Stalinism, some very humorous leader decided to give me a toast, a taste. At one 
12.30 in the morning of September 25th, I was arrested in my hotel. And while I can tell you that now very calmly, it was, it was not very pleasant. And what, what makes the story even stranger to me is that I knew at about four in the afternoon that this was possible because a friend of mine emailed me and said, get out of Russia, life or death. So uh, I was beside Hordakovsky in the appeal, and he was in, at that point, not a cage. He, I called it a Star Trek moment. He was in a sort of uh, container within the appellate court, as if we should not share the same air. And I looked over at him, and in fact, I left the court and started to go to the airport because of the practice. I've I've been involved in various revolutions and coups, and when someone sends me an email that says, get out of town, my instinct is normally to get out of town. But I realized what a message it would send to leave, particularly because if I was going to be arrested, I didn't want to leave fleeing. As a young lawyer, my advice to the poor people who had both been charged with an offense, and then to compound that, had the misfortune of hiring me. My one piece of advice always, particularly to my repeating offenders, was whatever you do, don't run. Nobody ever draws a positive inference about running away from the scene of a crime. So I said, I wasn't going to run. And in light of all of the harassment we'd all gone through, I didn't think it was appropriate to leave. So the hours, the hours waiting to be arrested in Russia, knowing that poor Svetlana was already in jail, were harrowing hours. And uh, I called the US State Department and was assured by the State Department that there was no possibility of my arrest. This could not happen. This is a new Russia. I mean, do you really believe what you say on the radio, they asked me. This is not, you know, this is a new Russia. So, the police arrive, and I call the State Department. And I remember putting the receiver to the hotel room door, and there was screaming because they had taken hotel employees and brought them with them. They wouldn't let the hotel employees warn me, and the hotel employees were screaming because they they didn't they were afraid they were going to stage an attack, in which case I'd have just been murdered. So they wanted to make sure I was up, and that you know. I was aware of what was going on. So six of them are outside wanting to take me away into the night of Moscow. And I, I had called the press and I said, look, if you, if you take me, you'll be physically carting me out of here because I won't walk. And that was probably a real daunting proposition to them. So we ended up negotiating through the night and I held a press conference, mind you, but I got on the plane the next morning, and uh, a number of my colleagues left, and um, I have not been able to go back since. So it is, um, it is very difficult to explain what, it's, what message it sends that they could do this to a lawyer simply because you are defending somebody that the power does not want to see have a defense. And one other thing we had done, which I think is important from a human rights perspective, is we had gone to the Council of Europe. And I don't know if there are lawyers here, but if you do any political work, there really, there, there really are no law books to tell you what to do in a show trial. There, you know, you just can't, you can't go and get the horn book on show trial defense. So we had to create this from whole cloth. And what we did was we went to the Council of Europe three days after his arrest. And we said that we wanted them to appoint a special rapporteur, someone who would be invested with some form of quasi-judicial authority to conduct an investigation. And we were blessed that 
this actually happened, they appointed a German, a former German justice minister. And this justice minister came with us to Moscow, demanded to see Khodorkovsky, demanded to see the prosecution. And the Russians were so shocked at the appearance of this woman that they actually complied. She held interrogations of them, and we supplied her with volumes of information. And she issued a finding. And her finding, which was issued months before the trial was over, essentially said that this was a show trial and that there was due process was not being adhered to. And that finding, which occurred literally months after his arrest, has saved many lives. The Russians have not successfully extradited anyone out of Europe to Russia to face charges related to UCOS as a result of her work. And the Swiss court only last month issued a precedent-setting decision, the first time in Swiss history they refused to cooperate in a case of mutual legal assistance and held that the proceedings in Russia were not in compliance with international law. So, uh, you know, strange, out-of-the-box thinking can lead you to some interesting results. Terrific. Thank you very much. Barack Obama lives a few blocks that way. Uh, let's assume that he were to ask you to counsel him as to how to deal with Russia and Putin and his people uh, if uh, he becomes president. What would you advise? I, I think it's, it's frankly quite simple. I think the situation with Russia requires a tremendous amount of strength. And begging Russia for help on Iran undermines our credibility. Uh, and it undermines, uh, it really undermines the belief that we're engaged in a coherent foreign policy. Because uh, Russia sees itself, and not Russia, the Kremlin really sees itself as a geopolitical opponent of the United States, particularly in the Middle East. And uh, this idea that we can get Russian help uh, without it costing us a tremendous amount yeah, it simply is not being respected, which is why, in my view, the Israelis launched their attack on Syria in September, because there's obviously a tremendous amount of activity going on uh, in states other than Iran uh, relating to all of this. The Russians have tremendous abilities to mobilize against U.S. interests in a Middle East where uh, the United States is uh, enmeshed in Iraq. And uh, the Kremlin requires strength. Interestingly, very quietly, the United States has been leading a fight against kleptocracy. And there is a UN Convention on Corruption, and the United States, just very quietly over the last few months, has been raising the specter of this anti-kleptocracy -klepto legislation, which will take away visas from corrupt government officials. Well, I'll tell you, if the United States were to ever use that type of legislation relative to the goings-on in Russia, we would have a new relationship with Russia overnight. It is the impunity of those at the highest levels of the Kremlin that that continues to guide Russia in the wrong direction. I think it is not beyond the ability of, of this government, this administration, to do a hell of a lot towards Russia that just isn't being done because, unfortunately, our uh, entire set of priorities are uh, uh, one, two, and three uh, are all Iraq. Uh, Mr. Amsterdam, thank you for coming to the University of Chicago. I wanted to say, in the West, many view Khodorkovsky as a kind of sacrificial lamb among oligarchs and his trial as having implications for democracy and private property rights in Russia. And many average Russians would say that Khodorkovsky is another businessman who got caught doing something and is being persecuted. What view do you think accurately encapsulates the situation based on your experiences with the trial? Look, uh, 
Um, firstly, you used businessmen in the Russian derogatory sense, uh, which I'm very used to hearing. Uh, when people apologize for asking me rough questions, I tell them that having defended Khodorkovsky on the streets of Moscow for two years, you really can't ask me a tough question here. Uh, I'm fairly privileged to know him. Uh, he could have left Russia, in fact, with me. We had discussions, very personal discussions, about the fact that we all knew he was going to be arrested. Um, in fact, I always say that he is the only person in Russian history ever arrested flying into Russia. I think that defines the man. You know, when people ask me, well, what do you think of Khodorkovsky? I think he's an amazing guy. I, you know, he, he wouldn't leave. He wanted to fight for his principle. And he was prepared to sacrifice everything for his principle. And now that he's in the gulag, his biggest supporters are not the oligarchs who abandoned him immediately. His biggest supporters are the political dissidents, are the human rights activists, that he funded. And even, you know, one of the interesting things about Khodorkovsky when you speak to people who worked with him in the media because he owned a newspaper at one point, is he never gave them an editorial line. He never told them what they had to do. He was not a choir boy. He is not Nelson Mandela. The 90s were a very rough period of time in Russia. He has apologized, I mean, way before he had a problem with Putin in the very late 90s. He made a, a public apology to uh, people that had been impacted by what had gone on in the 90s through him. Uh, he then uh, began this transparency campaign in 98, 99. He had his company audited by PricewaterhouseCoopers, the first one. He was the first Russian company to sign the Global Compact on Human Rights, 2001. He, uh, he announced that he was interested in retiring and going into civic life. He, uh, you know, they say he funded opposition groups, yes, but he also funded United Russia. He believed it was incredibly important that the KGB not take back the country. He believed it was important for him as a businessman. He believed it was important for him as a Russian. The only reason I was hired was because I had experience in a secret police environment in Latin America. And he wanted somebody who had dealt in that environment and would not run at the sound of a gun going off. So uh, he, you know, I, I think that a lot of the PR, and he had, he had PR in the States, and he, he became a sort of poster boy. Uh, what amazes me is that the PR that he got, which was quite positive, when you sat down and talked to him, it just really didn't do him justice. Because he was actually not only sincere when he talked about transparency and all this stuff, but if you read his speeches, he was incredibly captivating. I mean, one of the things that you don't hear about Khodorkovsky is there's a reason he's in Siberia and he's locked away. Because he is the most charismatic Russian I've ever met. He's also voted the handsomest Russian for a number of years. He has an incredible number of personal attributes that if you are a bland spy, look very challenging. So, um, you know, I'm tremendously impressed with Khodorkovsky. I never have seen representing him as a 
problem. And I, to be frank, I always, you know, when it comes to any of my clients uh, in these types of political cases, I always make my decisions based on a very personal chemistry and an assessment, in my view, on whether it's worth taking the risks that you take in a political case uh, on behalf of a particular individual. It's, it's, not, it's not the same kind of thing as just representing somebody in a hostile takeover. Uh, this was a hostile takeover where uh, the threat about taking captives and slashing and burning was all too true. And that's in many ways what this is. Uh, the Russian takeover of Yukos is like watching Gordon Gecko on steroids. And now the people who wanted to do this takeover are personally enriched by it and are directing the prosecution of these further charges. Next question. Why don't you come to the front if you want to be in line? That'll be helpful. Mr. Amsterdam, can you comment on the recent effort to put together a opposition force? You know, the other Russia, how do you think they should behave? Do you think they have any chances in the foreseeable future? You know, the decision to make uh, Kasparov a front runner at the elections? Look, um, To know Russia is to know that Gary has no real chance. Um, but I think it's very important because I think that role protects him. And I think that, uh, you know, when you're assessing what's going on, there, civil society has no spokesman in Russia. There's only a handful of people that are prepared to speak. So I think that he, I think that we're, we're you know, we're, we're at a very early building stage in terms of Russian civil society, and I think it's very positive. He doesn't have a hope in hell, and nobody should believe he has any hope in hell in terms of actually winning anything, but his very existence and the fact that he's there is tremendously important, and we should all support his efforts, because I think it's, you know, I, I can't underscore how important and courageous he is. Um, just like Gregory Pasco, another uh, individual that uh, he actually, I have a blog, and Gregory is an environmentalist, and he writes for the blog. Uh, and Gregory and I just came back from Australia, because the Australians were going to sell, and as of now, are going to sell uh, tons of uranium to Russia. And it was a fascinating week we had in, in Australia trying to explain to the Australians who Mr. Putin is, where the uranium is going, how the Russian nuclear industry works. We started on a Monday, and by Saturday they did a poll, and 70% of Australia decided, hey, uranium sales aren't such a great idea. So who does the Australian government trot out to support uranium sales to Russia? Condi Rice. I mean, you just, you just got to ask yourself. Condi Rice gives a public statement that says, it's not so bad. We can live with it. Thanks, Condi. But uh, what was amazing in Australia was I had done two trips. On my first trip, we were, we were met with what I call this presumption of regularity. People want to think Russia's a country just like Australia. If the Russians are going to sign a treaty that says they're not going to mess with the uranium, hey, they're not going to mess with the uranium. They're a country. They have control. And when you tell them it's just not how Russia works, and sitting at my left is a man, Grigory Pasco, who was a naval officer in Russia, and who, as a reporter, for the Russian naval newspaper wrote about the discharge of radioactive waste into the Sea of Japan. As a result of his reports, he was charged with treason. He was kept in the gulags. 
and the secret police ordered him to be murdered. The only reason he survived was that the Russian mafia ordered him to be saved because he had a legal degree, and Gregory is a very close friend. You can't find a sweeter guy. And from the moment he got into jail till the time he was leaving, he was the counsel to all these prisoners. So when the Russian mafia got the order from the secret police to kill him, the leader of the mob in that particular area said, no way, we'll kill you, because they actually run the prison. Uh, so when you have a guy with that history on national radio in Australia explaining to the Australians that Number one, that's not really how it works in Russia. And number two, you know, I don't know if I'm going to be arrested when I come back from Australia just for telling you this. It has a very powerful uh, impact. You mentioned briefly political apathy in Russia, and you were sort of comparing it to the US. And I was wondering if you could elaborate that on, a, on that a little bit, and also maybe compare it to a place like Hungary, where it seems to be quite the opposite. You, you think uh, political apathy does not exist in Hungary? Um, just like when there were riots when the prime minister was found to have lied When Gershkani was saying that... Yeah, yes, well, so at least on the surface it seems like there's some... Well, I'm Hungarian, so I, I, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm somewhat close to Hungary. I, I think... I spend a lot of time in Hungary and Poland, especially now that I can't get into Russia, and I find... Uh, outside of the outrage over this tape, I, I find throughout Central Europe there is a tremendous malaise. In fact, many people have written about it and talked about it. Um, and I don't, I don't see, unfortunately, that malaise is dissipating. Because of the cynicism, uh, because of the lack of leadership, uh, and because of the, the uh, lack of spirituality, the lack of uh, common values. Um, it's very hard to describe, uh, and it, it might interest you that I find the, you know, the great thing about the Constitution of the United States and about the American people is that there is a tremendous ability in this Constitution and this people to right the boat. We've all gone a little crazy in the last number of years watching Mr. Cheney do what he's doing, but I get a sense that the boat may be righted. I'm not happy about any of the potential captains, but uh, we're certainly going to see, I would think, some pretty major changes. This institutional reconfiguration in Europe, particularly Central Europe, isn't happening. Uh, I'm very close to what's going on in Poland, and I'm very troubled about what's going on in Poland. Tremendous amount of corruption, tremendous amount of uh, societal fracturing. I mean, I think there's a, there's a tremendous issue of problems, and this election is um, difficult. So I don't compare, I actually think the the body politic in the U.S. is far healthier than what I see going on in, uh, in Central Europe. But, um, you know, one of the things I do see happening in Hungary and I see happening throughout Europe is a massive growth of the ultra-right. I, I, I did an interview this morning and I said there, there were two things in my life I never thought could occur. One was the tremendous growth I've seen in anti-Semitism, which when I was growing up I had thought would be a dead letter. And the second was the resurrection of Joseph Stalin. Uh, having been in Russia in the 70s, it would be impossible for me to imagine that after 1956, it would be possible in Russia to resurrect Stalin. But we are witnessing his resurrection.
truly a frightening experience. And it's happening. I know you're probably familiar with the textbook uh, issue in Russia today. Uh, this whole uh, Joe Stalin wasn't so bad idea uh, is something the Nashi are talking about. And it's going to grow because the this new Eurasian narrative is there. It's very powerful. The Russian, uh, the Kremlin in particular, is very intimidated by the Chinese model. They don't know how to fully address it. And this uh, merger of autocratic thinking as a, uh, as a tool of economic growth is something that, you know, they have this, this uh, idea that they're going to be able to spin this concept of sovereign democracy. And they're going to be able to spin it into some really cohesive ideological force. And this whole Eurasian idea is part of it. And I think it's, it's very dangerous because it's so cynical and it's so uh, incredibly uh, manipulative. But the fact is, it exists. The Nazi exists. BP exists. I mean, all of the, the various parts of the players, whether they're complicit or whatever else they are that are going on, uh, all of these facets exist. And they are in a, a uh, as I said, a, an, an unstable brew. And uh, for those of us who are fighting in terms of Russia, it's an incredibly difficult moment because uh, there really are no rules of the game. You touched in your opening remarks <clears throat> on the instability inside the Kremlin and that the Putin regime was trying to contain this instability. Could you please elaborate on that? Sure. I gave a speech in Guatemala many years ago where I said, you know you're in an oligarchy when the people understand commodities not by what they are, but by the names of the families that control them. Which I think is a great line. So in Russia today, if you wanted me to, I could take you through Kremlin 101. And we could look at some very, unfortunately, ugly human beings. And I can tell you what boards they sit on. I'll take one ugly human being. Igor Sechin. Igor Sechin. Really, you need a picture of Igor when you say these things, because Igor looks like the Igor that used to be on Rocky and Bullwinkle. But anyway, Igor, who was a an operative for some years, uh, Igor is a secretary of the presidential administration. He is very close to Vladimir Putin. He is also chairman of the board of Rosneft, Russian oil company. It was Rosneft that stole Yukos. And it was Mr. Sechin that designed the destruction of Khodorkovsky. And he did it with a man named Sergei Bogdanchikov. And what's amazing about these two guys is not how they plotted to destroy Khodorkovsky, but the fact that in Moscow, you can actually buy a recording of their private conversations describing the takedown of Khodorkovsky. And there's a very famous quote about Bogdanchikov telling Sechin then when, you know, when Khodorkovsky is tied up to a tree in the forest, he'll understand who's got the power. Khodorkovsky became an enemy of Sechin and Bogdanchikov because, among other things, in February of 2003, in a publicly televised 
discussion at the Kremlin, an issue was raised over a particular transaction called Severnaya Neft. This transaction, which was involved with Rosneft, put into the hands of various members of the Siloviki $600 million. And Khodorkovsky objected. And President Putin went crazy. Khodorkovsky objected. Objected and threatened Khodorkovsky. Beside Mr. Sechin and Mr. Bogdanchikov, there is Mr. Medvedev. Mr. Medvedev, also someone known as a, a close, uh, he's actually now deputy, uh, formally, I believe his title is, essentially he is, he is one of two people sharing the number two spot in the administration. He is head of Gazprom. He and his faction, the Gazprom faction, oppose Sechin and his faction. In addition to which, there is a, besides Sechin, there is a group of men who form part of what are called the Siloviki, the members of the power ministries themselves. These people vary between whether they're more connected to those behind Gazprom, whether they're more connected to those behind Rosneft, whether they're more connected to those who are involved in the control over the atomic industry and the military and munitions industry. All of these various clans are fighting for control over assets because once the election happens, there's this Russian concept of roofs. If you lose your roof, you lose your protection. It's a very mafia-style mentality. So uh, you, you really, it, it, I always laugh when people try to quote Schroeder and, and try to determine how close to a democracy Russia is. I mean, Russia is as close to a democracy as the Gambino family is close to a democracy. Everybody gets a vote, but if you wrote the, vote the wrong way, they'll shoot you. I mean, it's, it isn't much of a democracy when, it, when you actually get down to it. Uh, speaking of these issues of nationalism and uh, xenophobia that you mentioned earlier, um, I, I was curious because it seemed to me, at least in the common view, that this is sort of a reaction to the concrete conditions in Russia right now, um, as often happens, and that in contrast to the instability, which you've talked about, especially in the case of Yukos, that for ordinary Russians, the Putin age seems to be a lot more stable. And so I was wondering, uh, given the quite real problems for ordinary Russians today, you know, what can Russian Democrats, who, have, who are blamed fairly or not for what happened in the 90s, what can they offer ordinary Russians? What is their counter offer? Well, I mean, I think that's a good question. Number one, I always find it interesting that in the West, there's this picture that Russian life has now become idyllic under Mr. Putin. If you go outside of Moscow, 20 miles, you're in hell. Life has not changed all that much for many. There are some towns where it has changed, but there's a massive amount of absolute horror and destitution in the countryside. So I'm, I'm never one that says that the Democrats have an awful lot of matching to do. The problem with with the Democrats, and the problem with the very opposition to Mr. Putin is he has defined a, a narrative that is nationalistic and involving respect for Russia. And the respect for Russia has increased geometrically with energy prices. That's occurred. And the middle class has grown to some extent. And I think that that will create a, an interest, a greater interest in interest articulation, in fact, than what's going on now. 
because there are no real rules of the road in terms of how various interests are going to be articulated. I think there, and, and everything I'm telling you is second or third hand, but my understanding is there are growing, there, there's a growing understanding in the intelligentsia that this bargain is starting to come due, that the level of corruption is reaching such grotesque heights that it isn't going, the stability is not going to continue. And the, uh, the increasing number of hits we're seeing in terms of the police, let alone the journalists and everything else, may well bode for this. But, you know, I can't, I, I don't think I can fairly answer the question. I would leave it to Gary to answer the question. And what he always says is, you know, you give me a Russia, give me seven days of Russians not having pablum fed to them on television, and I'll deliver a result. Uh, for a number of reasons, I'm not sure I buy it, but do I, do I, I, t I certainly take the view that with the explosion of the Russian internet and with the really serious systemic tensions going on inside Russia, uh, reactions will occur. I mean, it, it's hard for me to believe that the Kremlin lost in the Ukraine again. Uh, you know, there are occasionally positive signs that uh, Putinocracy or Putin's diplomacy or whatever is really starting to fall on deaf ears. It's a, sort of the same kind of thing we're starting to experience in Latin America with Chavez. Uh, all of a sudden, somebody who looked like he was on a roll uh, 18 months ago isn't on the same roll. And certainly, I see that based in Europe uh, in terms of just how uh, cohesive Europe is starting to get in terms of the reaction to Russia. That's, that's changed. Europe's changed dramatically in the last year or two. How do you think uh, the next year after, is it possible situation, uh, the result of power uh, fight in Kremlin that uh, Mr. Khodorkovsky will go out of jail? Does he have any chances? Well, you know, I, I would only tell you that I wouldn't be here if I didn't think he had a chance. I, I don't think he has a chance having anything to do with Chicago, but I think he has a chance. I, I, you know, one of the things about Russia and about the fact that there's no rule of law in Russia is that every day presents the potential for a solution. I'm a lay person, and really, to be honest with you, before tonight, I don't think I knew anything about Russia. But as I walk out of here tonight, I'm reminded of just one thing, how close we are to another Cold War. You talked about... To another what? Cold, Cold War. Cold War. You talked about Kremlin 101. Can you tell us, at least for those of us who have not followed Russia, the Duma or the legis legislature of Russia, how or whether or not systems legally or legislatively are being put in place such that someone like Putin could leave behind him a successor to potentially tie in this ideology of victimization and using security as factors to put us back to where we were during the Cold War days. Thank you. Well, I mean, two, two things I would say to you right off the bat. I never, I never argue that we're heading into Cold War territory very quickly. Number one, because I'd be embracing the threat that Mr. Putin wants us to believe exists, and it doesn't exist. And I don't think it'll exist for a generation. The Russian army is a complete disaster. Um, they're a disaster in so many ways, I can't even begin to express them to you. So, number one, that's, in my view, off the table. 
What is not a disaster, unfortunately, is the KGB, now known as the FSB, who have the legal mandate to order the murder of opponents of the Kremlin anywhere in the world. Legally sanctioned, no judge, no jury. Um, that's very frightening. Uh, the fact that there is no Bible of succession in Russia is really just part and parcel of the fact that the institutional underpinnings of democracy don't exist. And they're not moving in that direction. And that's why I'm saying that Mr. Putin is in something of a suspended animation in terms of what's going on. Because there is no really good exit for him. Because the key for, the key for him when he did the deal with Yeltsin was, Yeltsin for some reason, believed that Putin would have the power to protect him. As of this date, no clan agreement has been made that gives Mr. Putin that sense of security. I, on my blog, have said that I think it is still possible that Mr. Putin will not be prime minister, that he will um, simply exit as he had originally discussed and that this is just an attempt to maintain currency. In an autocracy, you don't want to announce, you don't want to do what Tony Blair just did in the UK, which was tell everybody you're leaving. Having watched Tony Blair live through that agony, I'm only reminded of some movie I saw where some poor schmuck said to the, the woman living with him who was no longer his wife that, you know, We'll have to share a home for a year. Well, I mean, you know, no exit strategy. Living in the same house with someone you detest is just not anything you want to recommend to anyone. And I think, unfortunately, uh, in some strange way, that's where Putin is. He's very, you know, people say he's very popular. Yes, I think it's true. But I then go back to the same question. Uh, Shetsova, whose book is on sale there, that says that Putin's popularity is an inch deep and a mile wide. And, and I agree. Uh, you know, uh, it will not be very long once he's gone uh, before the fixation will be on the, the next autocrat. Okay, any final question? This will be the last one. Yes, you said in the beginning of your speech that uh, there, there, there is very weak concern in, in, in Europe, in the States, about the situation in, in Russia and about the conduct of, of Vladimir Putin. So why is that? Why, between the political leaders and in, in the media, in the general discussion generally, is so weak, the, the concern about that? Thanks. Where, can I ask where you're from, sir? Sir, are, are you from Europe as Yes, yes, I'm Italian. Italian. Um, well, I, I mean, I can speak directly to the Italian issue. Berlusconi was Putin's soulmate, and now Mr. Prodi is trying to catch up to Berlusconi. Uh, it is. It is very complicated to explain the love affair with Vladimir Putin. It's, in, in a lot, to a large extent, outside of Italy and Portugal, I think it's over. I think the two remaining holdouts of the love fest are Prime Minister Socrates in Portugal and Prodi in Italy, and those that love affair is simply energy related in both countries. Uh, I think that the shut off of gas, the first shut off of gas to the Ukraine set a massive tectonic shift in terms of uh, Europe that the reverberations we're still getting today. I think that the murder of Litvinenko 
has destroyed Russian UK relations for a long time. Uh, and you know, they only found that out by fluke. There's a great movie that a friend of mine, Andrei Nekrasov, has just released on the murder of Litvinenko. And when you watch that movie, you realize that it is a, uh, uh, there was literally a one in a million shot that they could find that it was polonium. It's just incredible. So Litvinenko, the gas shut off, uh, Putin's May speech was another tremendous turning point when he compared uh, the United States to Nazi Germany. Um, so I think Europe is changing. And I think the reason it didn't is a mixture of opportunism and bribery. In Gerhard Schroeder's case, um, bribery elevates it. I, I, don't, I don't even know what to say about Schroeder. Um, but it's, uh, uh, it's this, you know, I talk about corporate foreign policy. It is this complicity of leaders that I find just so shocking. And in Europe, we've had these incredibly corrupt leaders, uh, Schroeder, Chirac, I mean, a moral IQ between them that couldn't heat water, you know, or, or anything else for that matter. So I, I think we've just had a perfect moral storm, and, and hopefully Europe's coming out of it. Well, I want to thank you all for coming, and I want you to join me in thanking Mr. Amsterdam for a terrific, uh, very insightful presentation. Thanks, guys.